You can now pre-order the M2 MacBook Air. But if there's one thing that Apple isn't particularly good at, it's helping you along that buying journey. Good news, that's why I'm here. Finally, pre-orders for the M2 MacBook Air are here. And if you're planning on grabbing one, I'm pretty sure you're gonna need some help spending the right amount of money. Don't worry, you are not alone with this. In this video, I'm gonna go through each of the spec options in the exact same way you would if you were browsing the Apple website. In fact, I'd recommend firing up the website now, heading to the pricing section for the M2 MacBook Air, and I'll put a link in the description so you can find it quickly, but we'll go through it together. We'll try and work out which M2 MacBook Air is right for you. I want you to set two budgets before we get started. The first is your ideal budget. It's the amount you can comfortably spend and wave goodbye to from your bank account without worrying. You still want value, obviously, but you've saved it, you've kept it aside, and that money is ready to go. The second budget is your stretch budget. This won't break the bank, but it's that little bit extra you can squeeze out of your bank account if you feel you need to. It won't feel quite as comfortable leaving your bank account as that other budget, but providing you get something in return that will offer you loads of value, you will get over it eventually. So with those two budgets in mind, let's get into it. We'll start with the base model, and since I began this channel in 2020, when Apple launched their M1 chip later that year, I've heard so much nonsense talked about the base model of all of the M1 Max. People will tell you that eight gigabytes of unified memory just is not enough in 2022. And for some use cases, that is absolutely the case. I totally agree. But if you have a use case for more memory, you probably know you have a use case for more memory. That's what I always say. If you're unsure if you need more memory, but you have a feeling that you're gonna be doing something relatively intensive, whether it be video work, audio work, coding, then focus on that stretch budget that we talked about earlier. And then put the emphasis on the amount of unified memory you feel comfortable buying. That way you get no buyer's remorse. For everyone else, eight gigabytes of unified memory is plenty. Ignore the talk about swap file usage and ignore the rumors of these mysterious out of memory messages, which I've never seen. So if your budget won't stretch much further than the base model M2 MacBook Air, just go for it. You will not regret that buying decision whatsoever. If you want to spend more money on your M2 MacBook Air, keep watching. There are two processor options for the M2 MacBook Air. They both feature that eight core CPU, but for $100 or 100 pounds more, you can swap the eight core GPU for a 10 core GPU. Is it worth it? On its own, no. I challenge anyone to spot the difference between an eight core and 10 core GPU in a MacBook Air. So I'd leave that option unselected for now and only select it right at the end if you think the addition of 100 pounds or 100 dollars is no big deal. Unified memory is far more interesting. And in fact, I've made an entire video on that subject, which I'll link to above. But in essence, eight gigabytes is for most normal users, as mentioned a moment ago. 16 gigabytes is for anyone who's worried about eight gigabytes not being enough and who has the budget to upgrade. And 24 gigabytes, which is a new option for the M2 MacBook Air, is for people who absolutely know they need 24 gigabytes. On to storage, and you get four options with the M2 MacBook Air, 256 gigabytes, 512 gigabytes, one terabyte and two terabytes. A bit like memory, there is a lot of nonsense talked about how much space you need on a modern laptop. If like me, you keep barely anything on your device, so you might use Dropbox or iCloud Drive, then the 256 gigabyte option might be viable. However, I would tread with caution on that one. Max Tech has done some tests on that 256 gigabyte SSD in the M2, and it does appear to be slower than the M1 version. Now, I'll leave a link above to an interview that I did with Vadim from Max Tech, and he goes into that a little bit more. So it's worth watching that to get your head around what that might mean to you. You may not notice it. That reduction in speed may not be an issue. It's just something to keep in mind. Storage from Apple isn't cheap. It doubles in price actually as you increase it. So I'd suggest going no further personally than 512 gigabytes unless you absolutely have a need for it and keep lots of very big media files on your laptop. I'm a big advocate of external SSD storage. I use it to edit these videos all of the time. I'll leave a link to my favorite drives in the description so you can check them out. But remember, the only thing you can increase in the future with your M2 MacBook Air is the storage. 
We now have a choice of three power adapters, and although this isn't going to be the most exciting thing that you put in your basket today, it's definitely worth covering. The M2 MacBook Air comes with a 30 watt charger as standard, which I think is fine for most people. If you want a faster charger, you can now spend an extra £30 or $30 and get the 67 watt charger. Is it worth it? Well, it's worth noting that you can get this charger for free if you opt for the 10 core GPU and at least 512 gigabytes of storage. If you don't go for that configuration and you're not that fussed about how quickly your MacBook Air charges, trust me, it's no slouch at 30 watts, I'd save yourself a bit of money. There's also now the option for a 35 watt dual USB-C charger where you can plug two USB-C cables into it and charge two devices. That is also 30 pounds or $20 and it can also be had for free if you go for that higher spec option rather than the 60 watt charger. But otherwise, I'd give it a miss. There are loads of cheaper third party options out there when it comes to multi-charging your devices. The last two things on your checkout list are pre-installed software and Apple Care Plus. I can't tell you whether you need Final Cut Pro or Logic Pro, but if you do, now is a really good time to put them into the basket. It doesn't make them any cheaper, unfortunately, but it does mean that your laptop will come with them pre-installed, which saves a bit of hassle. As for Apple Care Plus, I've never really spoken about it on this channel, and that's mainly because I never buy it myself these days. If you didn't know, it protects against accidental damage for three years, and you get expert technical support support from Apple, whatever that means. I can't tell you if Apple Care Plus is worth it or not for you, but in my experience, modern Macs are so robust. I know I'm tempting fate here, but I can't think of the last time I had a problem with a Mac that resulted in it going back to Apple. Remember, all Macs come with a one year warranty as standard, so you've got that much peace of mind regardless. I'll leave this one with you if you don't mind. If you're already into that stretch budget and you can't stretch any further, I just don't think it's worth reducing the spend elsewhere on your M2 MacBook Air just to make way for Apple Care Plus. If you do have more money to spend and you want loads and loads of peace of mind, just put it in the bag. And with that, we are done. I would love to know what spec you've ended up with, so let me know in the comments. A quick note on the M1 MacBook Air, I recently published a video that offered some advice choosing between the M1 and the M2 MacBook Air. I've had a few people, okay, a couple of people, tell me that the M1 MacBook Air is now obsolete and that I should stop recommending it. So let me go on record today, now, and say that is absolute tosh. The M1 MacBook Air remains a sensible, brilliant choice for lots of people. So if you think you might sit in that camp, keep watching for a link to that video.